Good morning, Barasta First United Methodist Church. Welcome and thank you for joining us in online worship this week. My name is Emily and I will be bringing you all of the important announcements before we get started in worship. Thank you to everyone that joined us this past Sunday at our outdoor service. It is always a special day when we get to see each other and worship at the same time. Another quick shout out to those of you that are watching at home every week. This past week, our children and youth were able to visit many of you, socially distanced, of course, and it was such a blessing and encouragement to see church family that we have missed since the pandemic first began. Please know that if you are not able to attend in-person worship services, or we didn't get to see you last week, your Valdosta First United Methodist Church family loves you, is thinking about you, and is praying for you. The month of August is a special month because for the next three Sundays coming up, we have opportunities for you to join us for inside in-person worship. After the service is over, please make sure to check out our website where you will find all details on how to attend, make reservations, and attend assigned Sunday school sessions. Sunday school classes have been assigned specific worship times, so contact your Sunday school leader for your schedule and more details. Our 11 o'clock sanctuary service is available for the next three weeks for those that wish to attend indoor, in-person worship services. Reservations and masks are required. You can make your reservation on our church website or call the church front office. Our online service always will be an option to you as well. And finally, I'm excited to announce that our middle and high school youth group will be returning back to in-person gatherings for the next three Sundays in August. Sunday night youth this semester will look a little bit different. It'll be at a new time. We will have new structure and new guidelines that will ensure everyone's health and wellness while we are having fun and learning more about our Christian faith. For more information or to receive our weekly youth news email, please contact me at my email address below. Want to know more information on any or all of the announcements you have heard this morning? Check out our church webpage for more details, information, and current church happenings. Again, thank you for worshiping with us. Join us now in singing our opening hymn. Good morning. At this time, let us join together in singing a favorite of all of ours, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. Today we're talking about fear. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Frady Pants. He's scared of everything. 
What are some things that you're afraid of? Are you afraid of the dark, of heights, snakes, bats, bad grades, talking in front of people? There are tons of things that people are afraid of. I know I'm afraid of lots of things. What do you think will happen when this pen represents all our troubles, everything that we're fearful of? And it gets into Mr. Scaredy Pants. Let's check it out. This is what happens when Mr. Scaredy Pants lets fear control his life. Oh, it explodes into a million pieces. That's what happens when fear controls your life. So we need to get Mr. Scaredy Pants something that will give him courage and give him peace in fearful times. Let's see what the Bible says. In Isaiah, the Bible says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Psalms 23, it repeats similar idea. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They give you peace. And again in Joshua, God says a very similar thing. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So what it's saying is that you need Jesus in your life. Put Jesus first in your life and have faith in Jesus that he can carry you through your troubles. And if you do that, let's see what happens when you give your fear to the Lord. <gasps> Nothing. It's courage, strength, and patience and peacefulness is what you get when you give your fear to the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather together to worship you, who comes to us when we least expect it, who calls us out of the safety of our ordered lives and invites us to join you in the adventure of faith. Lord, you know us too well. You know how easy it is for us to come to you and to proclaim loudly of our faith when all is going well. But when the waters get rough and the waves threaten to swamp our little boats, we cry and wail in fear. Forgive us. We are sure that these waves will be the very things that destroy us. Over the wind and the waves, you call us to place our trust in you. And that's not easy for us. We're so used to getting lots of reassurances and written guarantees of safety. But still, you call us. Help us to take our focus off the wind and the waves and place our gaze directly on you. Attune our hearts and our lives to hear your call and to respond in faith. Life does get crazy sometimes. We love the smooth times when all is well, but, oh Lord, we have serious problems with wind and waves. We want you to fill ourselves with a lovely breeze that guides our little boats across the glassy sea. But you know that life just isn't glassy seas and gentle breezes. Sometimes things just get rough. Help us place our trust in you during all these rough times. It's faith over fear. You call us to reach out, to take our focus off our own panic and place our trust in your love. Help us reach out to others with the same kind of love and compassion you have given us. Today, we have come to you with burdens and cares our seas are not calm, but you offer us a lifeline, a hand. Be with us, guide our lives, give us courage and hope. Strengthen us to truly be your disciples. All these things we ask in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught us his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we get ready for our message this morning, we come to the point of our service where we think about our offering to God. And we've got our, our talented music staff going to lead us in some special music and give us a chance to reflect and prepare our hearts for worship. But we're also reminded in this moment of our opportunity to give back to God out of the ways that he has blessed us. And so we want to remind you of the ways that you can give to your church. You can give uh, financially online through the mail. You can drop donations off at the church. There are many ways that you can give to the church, even during these times when we're easing back into in-person worship, and many of us are still worshiping at a distance. But also, we give to the church by supporting the church through our prayers, our presence, even if it's online presence, and, and through our service and our witness. And so we want to invite you to use this time to reflect on how God might be calling you to serve the church, to bear witness to what God has done in your life, to pray for your church and for your leaders and for our ultimate ministry within our community and, and within our congregation. And to also be present, to be here, to support your church, even in the times when we are not present together. Let us pray together. Lord, we ask that you would use the gifts that we receive through our, our offerings, through the mail, through online, and through them, you would do incredible ministry through your holy church. We ask all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. as we jump into our sermon today. What are you afraid of in life? Today we're talking about the idea of fear. And I would say that fear is usually defined between the tension of what is absent and what is present. Those simple ideas of absence and presence drive a lot of our fears that we experience in life. Let me share just a, a quick story of something that's going on at my household today. We have a four-year-old daughter who is just a wonderful bundle of energy, full of life, and she is a bundle of energy even in the middle of the night. We have been struggling for the past few weeks with her sleeping all the way through the night, and one of the things that challenges her sleep patterns is a fear of hers. And I've noticed the past several times I've had to go in there in the middle of the night or as she's trying to fall asleep, she wants me to check under the bed. She wants me to check not just one, but the other closet as well. I have to check not only the bathroom, but even in the tub and in the closet in the bathroom, just to make sure there's nothing there. And she fears the presence of something 
But it's not really the presence of whatever it might be that she fears. It's the absence of me in her room. For when I am present in her room, she doesn't sense that there is anything to fear. There's an absence of whatever it is that she's afraid of. Fears are not just something that we experience in, in our childhood. It's something that transpires all the way into adulthood. There's a website called fearof.net, and fearof.net describes the top 100 fears that adults suffer from. You know what number one is? Fear of spiders is actually more common in women than men. Nearly half of the women in America struggle with the fear of spiders. Now, I'm not saying that to put one gender against the other. I'm right there with you on number one. I'm also right there with you on number two, which is fear of snakes. And if I'm being completely honest, I'm not too crazy about number three, which is fear of heights. But there's number eight that was particularly interesting to me, and I think they might have to revise the list after we finish 2020. Number eight is fear of germs. This has been a season which the fear of germs has run rampant. I'm the kind of guy that when I walk in the bathroom, I'm washing my hands, I'm scrubbing real thoroughly, and then I walk out and look for hand sanitizer just to be sure. You know, it, it's always interesting. It used to be something that would be made fun of to have hand sanitizer in every entrance of a church. In fact, there's a comedian named Tim Hawkins. He's a Christian comedian, and he has this great little sketch that he does about hand sanitizer being right there when you walk in the church. He said, what a terrible sign of welcome when people walk in and you're trying to shake hands with them and welcome them and then you shake their hands and then immediately, all right, all right, got to Got to lather up the hand sanitizer. And he, he elaborates it a little bit. And he's like, oh, where are you from? Oh, Arkansas. And then he just starts like pouring the whole thing over his head. It's a, it's a funny joke. But I would have to say that now the absence of the hand sanitizer when you walk into an establishment is a source of fear. Its presence, however simple it might be, provides a calmness, provides a sense of peace that everything's going to be okay, whether it is or isn't. There's a certain power with the presence of certain items within our experience in daily life. We fear the absence of other things in our lives as well. Maybe you have a loved one that has journeyed with you through life and they're no longer present and their absence causes a great source of fear in your life, not knowing how to charter the waters that lay ahead. You may be fearful of, of the absence of, of certain aspects of life being the way that they used to be. As the world changes, as life changes, there's fears that set in as a part of it. Parents at this time of year sending their kids back to school, there's the fear that they're no longer present with them and their absence gives them a sense of, of not being in control of the situation. But beyond that, there's the fear of the presence of sickness the fear of the presence of other concerns that we share as we think about what students encounter in their schools and what teachers encounter in their workplaces. Absence and presence are two driving forces within our understanding of fear and how it impacts our lives. We have in our story today from Scripture an incredible passage in which Jesus reveals not only his presence in the moment, but what that presence truly signifies. And the idea of fear runs rampant throughout this entire story. And we're going to pick up in the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, right where we left off last week. So Jesus has just, just fed the 5,000, a miraculous, wondrous scene in which the crowds were delighted. Everyone ate to their fullness, and it was a delightful experience. And then after that, Jesus is going to pull aside for a little bit, and the disciples are going to be alone. Jesus will be absent. The disciples will be present together, and there will be the presence of fears that emerge as part of it. Let's hear from God's holy word. Matthew chapter 14, picking up verse 22. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up to a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples 
walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They were so frightened, they screamed. Just when Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water towards Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. And as he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, how did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Within this passage, that idea of what's present and what's absent drives the fears and the understandings. First of all, we have right at the very beginning, Jesus is not present with them, but there's another presence that's looming. That presence is a strong headwind that is keeping the disciples from being able to make progress in the waters. Now, we know from reading the Gospels that many of the disciples were skilled fishermen. They would be no strangers to the sea, as many who lived in the region of Galilee would not have been. And, and they would have known how to handle the waters. And so they may not have had too strong of fears then, but then something happens that's alarming to them. Jesus begins to walk on the water towards them. Why Jesus decided that was the best, best path, I don't know. But he decided he was ready to go and rejoin the disciples, and so he starts marching across the water. And that presence becomes alarming. And their fear emerges because of that alarming presence of an undistinguishable figure making its way towards them. And as that figure comes towards them, they become Frightened. Now, it should be noted that there was a great fear amongst sea journeyers where they would be afraid of ghosts. That was a common fear in those days and age, time and age. But beyond that, there was a sense that there was something more powerful at work. Control over the water was something reserved for the divine. All of the miracles they had seen Jesus do, the healing of people, the provision of food, all of those incredible things were amazing miracles that pointed towards the deity of Jesus, but they were also miracles that had been attributed to prophets, but not water. Control over water was something that was reserved for the power of God. It was something we find all the way back at the beginning of Scripture in Genesis where God's Spirit hovered over the waters. The spirit journeying over the waters was something that was divine. And so there was a fear of what is this power among us? Who is this that makes their way across the waters? There was a fear of the unknown of what they were experiencing. And the presence of that alarming figure was a great source of fear. But then there's a moment of serenity. There's a calmness because the presence is revealed to be the presence of Jesus. Jesus spoke to them and said, be encouraged. It's me. Don't be afraid. Now that particular passage right there in the original Greek where it says, it's me, in some tra translations it says, it is I, is actually the same Greek phrase in the Greek Old Testament for the divine name of God, I am. It denoted that not only was Jesus identifying who he was, but he was identifying who he was. He was identifying not only that he, Jesus, their master and rabbi, was among them, but he was connecting his being and his presence with the presence of God Almighty. And there in that moment, there's a calm. You feel a little bit of a calmness in the story. The narrative, like the waves, seems to calm a bit. So much so that Peter replies with a, maybe a bit of timidity. We don't know exactly. Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water toward Jesus. Now this particular part of the story 
shows that the presence of Jesus that calmed the disciples leads to an absence of fear within the life of Peter and amongst the disciples. There's a confidence, there's a desire to take risks that otherwise would not have been there because Peter believes there's a presence there that he can move towards. Risk is one of those aspects of life that we often let get in the way of us. Many of our fears are driven not by something that's there, but our, our, our sense that it's not possible, that there's a risk in the way, that there's something that's not actually present that's preventing us from getting to where we need to be. About 20 years ago, a pastor and author, John Ortberg, wrote a book called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. And the idea of that book, based on this story from Scripture, was that if you want to experience the journey with Christ and, and the power of God working in your life, you have to be willing to get out of your boat. And what he meant by boat was not physically getting out of the boat and trying to walk on water. I, I don't think that's the moral takeaway of the story, and neither did John Ortberg argue for that in his book. But what he emphasized and what he tried to get across was that if we want to experience all that God has for us in our lives, we have to be willing to get out of our boat. And our boat can be defined as our fears. Our boat can be defined as our predispositions. Our boat can be defined by our prejudices. Our boat can be defined by things that we hold dear that are holding us back in life. There was a, a story I heard from a hospice chaplain several years ago. And, and what they shared was that when people in hospice look back on their lives as they know they're nearing the end, the regrets that they shared are not things they did not do. They were, th I'm sorry, not things that they did. The regrets that they shared were things that they did not do. It was risks they wish they had taken. It was steps in life they wish that they had taken. I wish I had spent more time doing this. I wish I had taken more chances with my life. That's what drove them. Similarly, I, I heard from a, a pastor sharing about that same time. And they said, maybe the reason that we have such a lack of faith today is because we're not stepping out in faith enough. And I, I've heard it said that our view of God is directly related to what we pray for. Are we praying for bold things? Are we praying to take great risks? Are we looking to step out of our comfort zone and embrace all that God has for us? For a moment in this story, Peter takes that journey. Peter takes that step. He's willing to put aside what he believes is possible and feasible and to take that step. And Peter is going to fall in the water. The next verse, Peter begins to sink because there's another presence, not just the presence of Jesus, but there's the presence of a wind that causes him to doubt and causes him to sink. And Peter, Peter gets a bad reputation for taking his eyes off of Jesus, being distracted by the winds. But here's what I would argue. Peter is the only being we know of other than Jesus who has ever successfully walked a few steps on water. I tried it once. I was up at Lake Junaluska, which is a Methodist retreat center up in North Carolina. It was winter time and the lake had frozen over. And I decided that I was going to walk out on the ice. And when the ice started to get thinner, I thought, if Jesus walked on water and Peter walked a few steps on water, I'm just going to keep on going. It did not end well. The ice began to crumble and my legs went down into the water. And my jeans were soaked up to the middle of my thigh, leaving me to walk back to the retreat lodge that we were staying in about a mile's distance with legs that were frozen and jeans that froze together and formed a shape that was not the same shape as my leg as I was trying to walk. It didn't end well. I can attest walking on water is not an easy task, but Peter did it. Peter was willing to step beyond his comfort zone because he recognized the presence of Christ. He recognized the presence of a Savior. He recognized that if the one walking on the water had control, yes, even over the waters, that was a power he could trust in. But 
But then he begins to sing. And the verse there where Jesus kind of scalds him a little bit says, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? And that word doubt there specifically means a double-mindedness. It's as though I want to believe, I'm trying to believe, but the circumstances around me are really calling things into question. I imagine we've all been there in our lives. We want to take a step of faith. We want to believe that God is faithful. We want to take that next step and maybe even take that risk. But our fears bind us. Something circumstantial happens and we begin to back down. We begin to lose hope. We begin to doubt. We begin to sink. But Jesus helps them up and they get in the boat. And something incredible happens when Jesus gets in the boat. It says, when they got into the boat, the wind settled down. The presence of Jesus led to the absence of fear and the absence of the storm they had contended with all night. And they began in the boat to worship Jesus, saying, you must be God's son. And what we find in this story is that the presence of Jesus makes all the difference. When Peter stepped out in confidence, it was because of the presence of Jesus. When the disciples saw the winds calm down, it was all because of the presence of Jesus. And what we find in our lives is that God does not promise us an absence of fear. What God promises to us is the presence of a Savior. It's not about fear going away completely. It's that when we know Jesus is present, the fears subside. And we can step out in confidence. We can step out in hope. I think back on the history of the Methodist Church. There's a great story of, of John Wesley. Uh, I've got his initials here on this Bible, uh, Wesley Study Bible. But John Wesley, when he was a missionary back in the 1700s, right here to Georgia, he actually served in the South Georgia Conference along the Georgia coast. And he had come to be a missionary to Native Americans. But it didn't go well. And he was going back to England feeling dejected, lacking hope in his life, his faith somewhat shattered. And as he was journeying back on a boat, a huge storm breaks out. And he was traveling with a group of German Moravians. And he became mesmerized by how they seemed to be completely unfazed to the storm going on around them. They were singing hymns of praise, they were singing songs, they were worshiping God, they were praying, and they were so devout. And he wrote in his journal, essentially, he wanted what they had. He wanted the kind of faith that they had, where they weren't bound by fear. They simply had a trust and a faith in God. I think about the history of this church right here. I think about how 161 years ago, the church existed in a little community called Truthville. And when the town moved to a place nearby called Valdosta, the church packed up and went with it. And they, they got property in this area, and they began to have church services, and they began to build buildings. And building after building after building was built, and fires came, and things did not always go like they should. But the church has continued to be here. It wasn't always certain waters, but people continued to step out in faith. And that legacy is why we are here today, because people took risks in their lives. They were willing to step out in faith, trusting that God would provide, and that the presence of Jesus was more important than any fears that might be present as well. Because God doesn't always promise the absence of fear, but he does promise the presence of a Savior, and that comfort and that hope. Several years ago, uh, I experienced this in my own life. Uh, Emma and I had been married for a few years, and she was wanting to go and do a study abroad program where her last clinical rotation would be in Italy. And this was for physical therapy school. She was going to live in Italy for two and a half months. And I was dead set against it. I said, there is no way. I don't want you to be absent. I want you to be present. And I had a really hard time. I was struggling with it deeply. And then one day, 
I felt like I needed to turn that fear over to God. And so I, I was driving home. We were living in Decatur on the outskirts of Atlanta at the time, and I was working in Macon. And so I was driving home late after a meeting at the church in Macon to our apartment in Decatur, and I began to pray about it. And then something incredible happened. I turned on the radio, and I, I'm ashamed to admit this to you, but I, I don't listen to Christian radio that much. But for whatever reason, the radio station that was on was a Christian radio station. And there was a popular song out at the time, and it's one that's been sung in contemporary worship services, and it's actually based on this story from Scripture. And it's called Oceans. And the idea of that song is God calling us out into the waters where our faith trembles and we have to trust confidently keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. And that song was the song that was on the radio when I turned it on in the middle of my prayer time. And I began pulling into the parking spot in our apartment complex. And it got to the, the pinnacle of the song, which says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water wherever you may call me. And I realized that maybe in the midst of this situation, that my fear was not driven by anything I needed to be worried about. It was not driven by anything that was present. I was afraid of the absence. And in that moment, I was reminded that on the waters, in the midst of turbulence and life, and things not being how we want them to be, that God would be present with me, that I could trust in the presence of Christ, and I could let go of control of that situation and believe and trust that God would have Emma in her hands, in his hands, and have me in his hands as well. Life is often like that. We find ourselves bound by fear, struggling because of what's present and what's absent, and in the midst of Fear may never be absent, but we can trust that the presence of God will always be with us. Thank you.
As we go forth out into our week, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to take a chance with? What risks are out there where God can make a difference through your life if you simply take a step to trust and believe? May you go out full of confidence in the presence of Christ in your life. May that guide you and sustain you no matter what life might bring your way. God bless. Thank you.